great day. I'm looking outside my window here in hmm, kind of cloudy Pennsylvania right now, and uh, but enjoying enjoying a, a little bit of a more relaxing type of day. You see on this screen, Dr. Oops, we pause that. Dr. Natalie Marks. Dr. Marks, where are you right now? I am downtown Chicago, and it is also cloudy and kind of yucky, but at least today I'm in a spring coat. So there is hope on the horizon that we are not going to sit in three feet of snow for the next four months. So we're happy about that. Yeah, I know we um certainly not not the snow that maybe you get, but uh, I don't know, I was the last one on my block with a little snow on the driveway and it finally men melted the other day and we're a little little unseasonably warm today, although I'm sporting my, my Becquerel sweatshirt. I, it's too comfy to take off these days. And as many of you all know, we love hearing, uh, hearing from you. Where are you logging in from around the country and around the world? So if you can go ahead while we are uh, giving everyone the opportunity to log in, type in where you are, are, where you are around the world. I, I know we usually have our friends from Portugal and Chicago and California, but we absolutely love uh, seeing where you're typing in from around the country and around the world. So go ahead and, and, and do that. Uh, I see our, our numbers creeping up. But yeah, we're going to give everyone just a few moments to, to log in. I can tell you it's been a great Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great week for us here so far. A lot of exciting stuff coming up from Vecro. Let's see here. Things are coming in now. Baltimore. Welcome, Melissa. M from Canada. See here, Helen from Nashville, William from Texas, Diane and Rob from Ohio, Canada, South Carolina. Now they're coming in fast and furious. Yay. Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, <laughs> South Carolina, Virginia, Michigan, Chile. Now, Chile. Welcome from Chile. So this is what we love. I mean, we absolutely it got. I mean, my smile can't get any any bigger. You maybe see my molars at this point. I thought United Kingdom. We love seeing people from around the world. It's just fun. To yeah. interact with everyone we have a super awesome talk and i've had uh the privilege of a, a quick preview uh, of dr mm -hmm. mark's presentation and i'm super excited to to be with you all today and i'm going to be behind the scenes learning myself so really excited again we'll give everyone just another couple of minutes to roll in we're just one minute past our normal start but i want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to roll in let's see cleveland uh let's see I don't know. I'm seeing Hawaii. That Japan. sounds pretty good. <laughs> we, have, we have somebody originally from Japan, but watching from Washington. Pretty cool. Love it. I'll go visit Renee. Renee, are oh, you hiring oh. in Kona, Hawaii? <laughs> Renee, oh, making me jealous. Making me jealous. I want to be in Hawaii right now. One of my favorite times ever was when my wife and I were in Hawaii. Oh, so jealous. So jealous. Well, let's get the party started because we have a lot of people that are rolling in. And please feel free to go ahead and type in where you're from because we'll be able to review it afterwards. We just adore. We love seeing it. And again, super excited to be here. I'm going to give Dr. Marks an opportunity to introduce herself in just a little bit. But I'm going to start the, the, the day off, the session off with a little background information. Again, we are here today on our YouTube Live platform, our YouTube Live Race Approved webinar. We're going to be talking about Lepto Cliff Notes screen test and treat better in small animal practice with our amazing speaker, Dr. Marks. And again, we'll get to Dr. Marks in a minute, but as we get to the session, I just wanted to thank Merck Animal Health for being an amazing educational partner and a sponsor of this session. Uh, as we always tell you, when we have the, the, the benefit of an amazing educational partner like Merck Animal Health, we provide our CE free to the veterinary community, the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health for being here with us today. If this is your first Vecoral event, we give Vecoral what I would like to say, uh, clinically relevant, practical, cutting edge information in a multimedia approach. And this is just one of the ways we give CE. This is a, on our social media, it's on YouTube. We also do traditional webinars. And our traditional webinars like today are small animal. We also do large animal nutrition, practice management, technician, leadership, and more coming up. That's what I was saying. We have so many great things coming out on the Vecro platform really soon. So really excited for you all to see that. Our leadership track, if I didn't say leadership track, we have a leadership track that is also race approved, but it's also CVPM approved. We also have podcasts. 
Our podcasts are downloaded in over 180 different countries around the world. So a great way to listen, whether you're walking the dog, on the treadmill, in the car, commuting to work, great way to listen and get some CE credit and educational content there. We also have a Vecro forum, a message board, a discussion board. So if you want a case consult, if you want a uh, little coffee talk and chat with somebody, if you want to uh, commiserate after a tough day, check out our forum. Our discussion board is for our members and we love to see you and interact with you there as well. And as I said, this is a social media event. We're on YouTube live broadcasting around the world. Whether you're with us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, uh, TikTok these days, I mean anything. Just make sure you inter interact with us on social media. Now, super important, and we'll mention this throughout the session as well, super important. Now, this is a race-approved event. So how are you going to get your race-approved CE certificate? As you see on the screen, there's a little QR code. So if I take my phone right here, right, and I put my camera, it's a camera, here's me, it's my camera, oh, there we go, all right. If I put my camera right up to the event itself, what you're going to see is it recognizes that it's a URL. You just click on that, and then up comes, doo -doo -doo, up comes right here, the form that you will fill out, okay? You fill out that form, it'll get a note. I will get a note that you are here live. So I have a little URL in blue. If you don't have a smartphone, you can type that in, tinyurl.com slash vglepto3-25-21. You type that into your browser, fill it out, or again, use your smartphone and that QR code, which will appear on multiple slides. Fill out that registration form. I will keep that form open until 2 p.m. Eastern today. That's 30 minutes after the session ends. Then we'll send you a CE certificate later today. So again, please make sure if you want your race approved CE certificate, fill out that form, that QR code, and we'll get it to you again by 2 p.m. Eastern today. We're starting at 1 to 1.30-ish. Give you an extra half an hour to fill out that form. This is on YouTube. So just so you know, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, I have a little arrow there that points to it. I'm going to solo it so it makes it even bigger for you right now. All right. So in the bottom corner, you see that little almost full square all the way on the right? If you click that, it will make it even bigger, your full screen, so it's not just part of your screen so you get everything on there. All right, I'm done talking. I know you're not here to, to chat with me today. We want to hear from Dr. Mark. So I'm going to sort of get myself out of this window and meet myself. But Dr. Marks, here we go. Here's you. If you can give us a little introduction. Again, where are you practicing? What do you do? And then please take it away. I'm going to meet myself. The floor is yours. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thanks, Garrett. And it's great to be back at Vet Girl with everybody. Um, I am a practicing veterinarian. I am a mom of three. I'm also an educator, a consultant, and I'm an celebrating my inner nerd that I am an absolute lepto addict. So this is right up my alley. I love this infectious disease because we can make such a difference by doing some of these things and really protecting our patients and our families so much better than we are now. And this is all from lessons I have learned in the last 20 years of practice as well as um, collaborating with a lot of experts in our field of infectious disease. So without further ado, because we have a lot to get through today, again, we want to thank everyone, of course, for um, being with us and also to Merck Animal Health for such uh, a wonderful sponsorship of providing this free CE. So Lepto, it starts just like this. It's just a dog taking a sip of contaminated water, whether it's a stream or a lake or a pond or a puddle in an alley or core draining uh, backyard. It's, it's just this, something this simple. So that drink of water with contaminated bacteria ends up creating an infection that can spread throughout the body to a lot of different organs. Mostly we think of liver and kidney, but we're going to talk today about a few of the ones we aren't thinking about. And then we end up with this infected patient and some of them in a life-threatening state. Next slide. So as we go through today, I want to make sure everybody understands why leptospirosis really does matter in small animal practice. If you didn't know this already, it is the most common zoonotic disease worldwide, and it's responsible for 60,000 human deaths annually. So with that being said, within the U.S., about 100 to 150 humans are infected with lepto. Um, we don't know if that's underreported or even underdiagnosed because human MDs, if you didn't know, only get one hour of zoonotic training in their whole schooling. So we are really the experts here. Next slide. 
So as we go through today, um, I want you to keep in mind that there have been quite a few lepto outbreaks as of late. Um, these are just a few listed. Two I want to point out to you um, of, I think, significance here. One is the uh, unfortunate natural disaster of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico in 2017. There were 74 confirmed human cases of lepto. But if you watch any of the documentaries of people being on the ground behind the scenes, people think that is very underreported. The other one that's been a great note, and actually there's a big paper that came out about that in this week's JAVMA, uh, was the Phoenix outbreak from February 16 to 2017. There were 50 positive canine cases in Maricopa County. This was startling for a lot of us because as you can imagine, what we thought was a very wet, rainy weather, moist climate disease, this happened in the middle of an arid desert. So we'll get to why that happened in just a second. Next slide. When I was in school, I learned that leptospirosis was a rural hunting dog disease. And we know if I can bust that myth right now, that is absolutely not true. Yes, they do get that. But this is a disease that's found in urban and suburban and rural areas. And I would argue that there's very few veterinarians out there that don't have a possible case of this at some point in their career. It is very underdiagnosed and underreported and not every state requires that being reported. So we don't even have a really true picture of how many cases of lepto there are. And now we know that there are dogs that have what are considered subclinical or some may call them carrier states where they are harboring the bacteria and acting totally normal, but shedding this bacteria into the home and also into the community. Next slide. Leptospirosis, just remember, can't replicate outside of the body. That's great for us because even though it's a spirochete, look at, and you can see his, their little friend there, Borrelia, right? The causative agent of Lyme, very similar bacteria in, in structure. Um, it can only replicate inside a reservoir host. And so that's good for us in hospitals because a lot of different disinfectants will easily kill this. It's good for us in homes in regards to us teaching clients the safe way to clean up accidents. Um, but it's very important for us to understand the reservoir hosts that we have that are possible um, risk factors for the dogs that we take care of. Next slide. Just a terminology I want to make sure everybody understands. We talk about leptospirosis in regards to serovars. Serovar is sort of like a strain, and there are over 250 out there, 10 important to pets. You see them listed in red there. Serovars have epidemiologic importance. And what I mean by that is if you're having several dogs that are coming in from the same neighborhood are positive for lepto, it'd be very helpful to get serovar testing, so the MAT testing, to figure out if we can find the reservoir host. Um, they also determine which organs are affected. As example, Gripotyphosa, which is the one I see most here, commonly uh, found in rats and raccoons, loves the liver. And so if you're seeing cases where only ALKFOS and ALT are elevated, again, that can direct you to some of the certain serovars. Next slide. The other thing to keep in mind if you're ever on Jeopardy, um, Ictero is the most common one uh, infecting humans, predominantly from rats. Grippo I mentioned and Pomona are the mo ones most commonly infecting our canine patients. Also keep in mind that dogs are a reservoir host for one serovar of lepto and that's Canicola. Next slide. So look at all these reservoirs. I haven't even listed or shown pictures of all of them. Um, we think of rats certainly in Chicago, but the urban wildlife I see, the raccoons and opossums and skunks and squirrels are out there. But there are also farm animal reservoirs and those a lot of times we forget about, namely cows and pigs. And with those um, reservoirs, again, it's important to keep in mind that if people live in the city and then, then take their dogs out to a, a horse barn to ride on the weekends where there's pasture land, there's lots of different exposures there that sometimes we don't think about, but certainly our clients don't think about. Next slide, please. So leptospirosis. Uh, another thing I want to talk about in regards to these urban myths or legends is that um, this is not, again, this large breed hunting dog disease. This is a disease that does not discriminate. Now, I'm talking about dogs predominantly today, but for all the cat lovers out there, don't forget it is rarely reported in cats. They've been outdoor cats with fever and jaundice. Um, I wouldn't keep it number one on your differential list, but certainly make sure to keep that kind of in the back of your mind in a zebra if you are ruling everything else out. But any age, any breed, any sex of dog here affected, 
the poster child for lepto right now, you're looking at her, the Yorkshire Terrier. Blew my mind when I heard this because certainly I don't think of Yorkies as the um, kind of the commanding force chasing down rats in alleys in Chicago. My Yorkies I see typically have little dresses on and are sitting in a chewy baton bag, but um, they are terriers nonetheless. And if we think about it, many Yorkie uh, clients and pet parents, at least in my experience, can sometimes be very hesitant about this vaccine or are getting direction from breeders or other sources not to have lepto vaccine. We also need to keep in mind that lepto is not just a rainy climate. Remember I mentioned the Phoenix, um, Arizona outbreak, that was from sprinkler activity. So all we really need is stagnant or slow moving water to be a risk factor for carrying this bacteria. Next slide. Transmission, the urban rat, up to 90% of urban rats shed this bacteria. There's a, a new study out that's looking at different cities and rats. So if you're seeing that and you're living in an urban environment right now, um, keep in mind, you look at a rat, the lepto is probably there. Once our dogs ingest that contaminated water, again, they can have that infection from direct ingestion or contact with mucous membranes, next. But we also have to keep in mind the indirect transmission. And I mean that mostly for all of you listening that are in hospitals, contaminated bedding is a risk factor for us and our veterinary teams for potential zoonotic transmission. So we need to make sure we're keeping those hospital team members safe, especially those that don't have this opportunity to have CE. Please make sure you're using PPE at all times and if possible, using closed urinary catheter collection systems so that we don't have these contaminated bedding um, exposures and putting them at risk. Next slide. Lepto loves kidney tubules. This is unfortunately a necropsy cross section for, uh, courtesy of Dr. Comfer of a, a canine that succumbed to lepto. Look at all that intra um, capsular hemorrhage. It's really awful. Patients with lepto, here's the thing guys, it, it can be any of these scenarios. We can have the asymptomatic carrier walking around shedding the bacteria. We can have that textbook acute illness or we can have the patient that responds and gets over lepto, but can potentially shed um, in the environment. So we have to keep all three scenarios in mind. Next slide. How do these dogs present? Well, again, that textbook acute dog three to four days after infection comes in febrile and vomiting and having diarrhea and changes in appetite, either hyporexic or fully anorexic abdominal pain. They might also sort of do that walking on eggshells, muscle icky kind of pose that we think of with tick disease. That's called myalgia in people, sort of like after you got the flu vaccine. Um, so if you see a dog acting like that, keep in mind lepto. But next slide. Don't forget these. The two I've highlighted here I think are most important. Conjunctivitis and uveitis is a good key for us to kind of take a flashlight into that body and look for lepto. We think of tick disease with uveitis, but remember they're both spirochetes. So if you're screening for tick disease, screen for lepto. The other is PUPD. I cannot tell you how many times I have found a positive lepto case on a PUPD workup. I do five things, a low colony urine culture, a bile acids, an ACTH stim, abdominal ultrasound, and lepto PCR. It's a great five-step workup, very complete to look for that source of PUPD. Just of note, don't think these are all yellow dogs. In fact, studies show that less than 12% of our dogs show icterus. So if your dog is not yellow, don't rule out yet lepto yet. Again, that's a minority population. We can also see prolonged clotting times and in rare cases, respiratory distress. Next slide, please. So again, I told you I'm a lepto nerd, I love this disease, but I think this is really helpful for younger associates or people just don't see lepto very often. How do we keep this at the forefront of our minds so we do the best job as public health officers? I sort of use this. Remember, it's liver and kidney, enzyme elevation, PUPD, thrombocytopenia, and oliguria. Remember that really significant decrease in urine production. If any or all of these are presenting in your patient, please make sure to screen for lepto. It's very, very important. Let's look at the clin path behind this. First, let's look at our, our chemistries. Greater than 80% of our dogs are gonna be azotemic. Those liver-loving serovars are gonna go to the liver and create elevated ALK loss and ALT. If you have a GI dog, they're gonna be hypokalemic because of GI losses, and those liver dogs may have an elevated bilirubin. Next slide. But don't forget the CBC because up to 58% of these dogs are gonna be thrombocytopenic. 
And instead of just thinking tick disease, when you have that 135 or 145,000 platelet count, think of lepto. You'll, you'll find some cases you wouldn't have found otherwise. We might see a stress leukogram in an acute case and certainly non-regenerative anemia in a chronic case. Next slide. And don't forget your liquid gold. Don't just draw blood, draw urine too. Again, using PPE and making sure you're staying safe because greater than 50% of these dogs will have glucose spilling over. It's not Fanconi syndrome, it's not diabetes. Look for lepto in these dogs. Sediment might also have some protein in bilirubin and remember it's gonna be a pretty dilute urine. Even hyposinuria can be seen when there's really severe proximal tubular damage. Next slide. So the big thing, right, is the test for lepto itself. Where do I use it, when, and how do I pick which one? So I'm gonna go through this as quick as I can, but as thorough as I can, because I know there's a lot of questions arise. We always wanna have at least five to 10 mils of urine and a mill of serum prior to starting antibiotics, and that's what's used for some of this testing. Gold standard right now, PCR. It's detecting the lepto RNA or DNA. This is not a serovar test. You see the result on the side there on the left. It's a positive or negative. It doesn't tell us which, which one. But the beauty is, is that if you vaccinated a dog last week, and tomorrow you have a case that comes in that's a febrile Yorkie with thrombocytopenia and GI signs and just ate a rat, you can actually test and have no cross-reactivity from the vaccination. It's a really great uh, pro of this test. But keep in mind, blood typically does not convert to a positive for 48 hours and urine can take up to two weeks. So if you have that classic case and you send out a PCR and it's negative, either it's just not lepto or you've tested too early. Remember, we just have not seen that test pick up the RNA and DNA. The other test is the MAT test, and that's the antibody test, microscopic agglutination test. So a little more cumbersome. We do need two serum samples, seven to 10 days apart, but this will show you that serovar. You see that on the right there. The first sample is usually negative in acute disease. Not surprising to us, right? Because we haven't had time to see antibody production. It takes about six to 10 days post-infection. But this does have some potential cross-reactivity with recent vaccination versus natural exposure. So nothing black and white here, but just a crude guardrail for you. Most vaccine associated titers that you'll read are gonna be less than one to 800. Most natural exposures are going to show a fourfold increase in titer greater than one to 1600. There typically is a difference. And of course, natural exposure is always gonna produce stronger and more effective antibodies. Next slide, please. So here's your cheat sheet, screenshot it if you need to. If you have a PCR that is positive, you've got a slam dunk. That patient has lepto RNA DNA inside the body. It has leptospirosis. But if it's negative, either it's not lepto, you're missing it, you're missing the actual disease, or it is not enough DNA for the test. And you can either start treatment or shift to, next slide, a different test, the MAT test. So if you're doing a table side or point of care SNAP test in hospital, remember those are antibody tests or a MAT test. If that's positive, you do have another step. You've got to check for vaccine history. If there's been recent vaccination, you'll want to run the PCR for confirmation. But no history of vaccination, again, slam dunk, positive test. But if that SNAP or MAT is a negative, again, just like the PCR, you either don't have lepto or it's too early. We need that 10 days. You'll need to send that second sample for conversion. So lepto to me alone is a huge reason to always have ampicillin and doxycycline in your hospital because the first line of therapy for this disease is always antibiotics. Ampicillin for those critically ill, vomiting, or patients that can't keep anything down by mouth, 20 to 30 mg per keg IV every six to eight hours stops the bacteria from traveling around the bloodstream. Next slide. But if you've got a patient who is stable and going home, thankfully those dogs can go home on doxy and that's 10 mg per keg once a day for 14 days. It clears the leptospires from the kidney. You'll wanna treat every canine in that household concurrently so that they make sure they get the full 14 day course. If you've got a patient in hospital that's azotemic, has elevated liver values, certainly dehydrated, IV fluid therapy, a must. LRS or Normar is your fluid of choice. Remember, look at that fluid rate, two and a half to four and a half times maintenance. You really wanna make sure you have somebody monitoring that patient closely making sure there's no fluid overloading and you're monitoring ins and outs and that's not all going in and getting 10 mils of urine production. Warn those clients, azotemia and clinical signs need to resolve before they come off IVs and that's on average two to four days. So this can be a long haul. 
A lot of these dogs have GI signs, so antiemetics are a must. Meropotent's my drug of choice, but any of these will certainly work and be effective. If you're using meropotent, one mg per kg sub-Q or IV once a day. Next slide. You'll also want to make sure to use H2 blockers. Remember, it's not just the GI dogs. Any renal patient that's been has an acute renal injury or chronic renal disease, remember those toxins can advance to uremic state, which can cause severe gastric ulceration. Use your H2 blocker of choice, minus famotidine. Next slide, please. And if you've got an, a liver-loving serovar like Grippo that's affecting your patient, SAMI is very helpful in liver cell regeneration. And Ursa deoxycholic acid at 10 mg per kg twice a day is a choleretic. It's essentially Drano for the gallbladder. Um, leptospires love to hide in the body. One of their hiding places is the gallbladder itself. So use that so we can clear the, the bacteria into the bloodstream and certainly treat effectively. So we need to do three things with lepto. We need to protect our well patients. Those dogs that might be coming into you for their annual exam tomorrow and are PUPD, but the owners are, are just not sure how to even describe that to you. Good history taking, making sure we're asking about water consumption and urine production for those carrier places, carrier states, any other dogs in the household, travel, and certainly vaccine history. Next slide. We also need to protect our clients. In one study, 10% of infected humans developed lepto from contact with their pets. And that was our fault, right? So we need to make sure we understand the protection guidelines, discussing zoonosis from day one with all these brand new pandemic puppy parents, and to understand urine shedding. Seven to 10 days after infection, they can become carriers. Next slide. And finally, protecting our hospital teams, right? I talked about that indirect transmission from contaminated bedding. StopLepto.com, Merck has put together. It's an excellent website with tons of resources, including this Recognize, React, and Reset training document for your hospital on how to safely set up a patient in hospital for Lepto and handle them, making sure everybody, I think everyone's sick of PPE talk, but making sure we're all using that for sample collection and patient handling. Thankfully, like I said, because it doesn't replicate outside the reservoir host, any of these um, disinfectants will kill leptospires within your hospital. Next slide. So we've talked uh, most of this about screening, testing, treating. I really want to make sure everybody leaves today, though, understanding that the best strategy to protecting our patients from lepto is vaccination. You want to make sure when you're looking at vaccines and talking to clients about it, you're thinking of a few characteristics. One, you want to make sure it's a four serovar vaccine for the most thorough coverage. Talking to your clients about the fact that this is not the vaccine of the 80s or 90s anymore. There's been exponential improvements in vaccine technology through the process of diafiltration, protein removal, so it's a very smooth vaccine for less reactivity rate. And we do see less kidney and liver disease in our vaccinated patients. That's proven in research. Next slide. But when you're choosing vaccination, these other things are very important. One is starting early, starting again at eight weeks of age. This is in studies that a prevalent study just came out of Ohio State, the Ohio State University showed that a lot of these dogs were getting lepto at eight weeks. So we have to start early, booster two to four weeks, revaccinate annually, especially those dogs that recover. This is not lifelong immunity. But choosing a vaccine, again, that protects against leptospiremia, the thrombocytopenia, urine shedding, such an important part of zoonosis prevention and herd immunity, herd health and community health, and also mortality. Next slide. So I know I zoomed through that, but I want to make sure we save some time for questions. And uh, Garrett, feel free to throw that last slide up too if you'd like uh, for my direct contact if anybody has questions afterwards. All right, let's see here. All right, I should be back. Hopefully everyone can see and hear me. That was awesome information. And yeah, Zoom, sure, but this is lepto cliff notes, right? <laughs> This is this is the, the the bones of what we need when that patient comes in and uh, for life saving therapy. You know, awesome information. Really appreciate uh, um, all of those slides and all that important information. And I do want to get to a few questions. What I will do is I'm just going to quickly throw up one of the slides from the beginning of the presentation as a reminder. And I put this up several times as well. And I'm going to solo this for one second so you can all see it again. Remember, if you want race-approved CE, this is a live interactive race-approved educational session. You can either, that little blue URL, that'll give you to our registration form, or again, if you take your smartphone and use that QR code, 
Uh, fill out that form. We're going to keep that open until approximately 2 p.m. Eastern today. So you still have another 32 minutes on my clock to fill out that form. And then uh, by tomorrow morning, the latest, we will send you an email with your CE certificate. So please make sure you fill out the registration and attendance form so we can get you your CE credit. With that said, um, just very briefly before we get to some questions, um, as I said earlier, I definitely wanted to thank Merck Animal Health. Uh, Merck Animal Health sponsored today's session. They're an amazing educational partner and it was their support that we're able to provide Dr. Marks in this educational session complimentary free to the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health. With that said, I would love to get through a few questions and um, I knew this was gonna come up because I loved when you, I, I love like rules of three or rules of five, like <laughs> yeah. it's just great. Like it's, it's, it's like, it's like chicken noodle soup on a cold day, right? Like it's stuff you just love. You, everyone loves hanging on to that. And so Brandy asks, what were those five things that you were talking about and what do they relate to again? Was it just lepto or is it a PUPD patient or can you review that again? For yeah. Us? Yeah. So PUPD workup in general, I think it's great to just kind of keep these five always in the back of your mind. And some clients will be like, just do them all right now. And some might be like, I'll do one today and one in two months, but I'll get through them. Nonetheless, it's important to think about this because this is how I've caught some of my carrier lepto patients around Chicago. So five-way workup. Urine culture, make sure it's a low colony count because we could be missing some of those low-grade pylos with just getting a regular urine culture. Second is bile acids, looking for liver dysfunction. The third, ACTH stim, Addison's or Cushing's, either way. The fourth is abdominal ultrasound for screening for anatomical reasons for that. And the fifth, and to me, of course, the most important today, lepto PCR. It's really, really helpful. And I've been able to get a really good, thorough database. Most of the time, you can find an answer. Awesome. Uh, what if you have, so what is your protocol? I mean, everyone has a slightly different one, but you have a patient that comes in that has characteristics that make you worry this could be lepto. At what point? Do you either in hospital isolate them to some degree or talk to the family about things to watch for? And if you can give us a couple of like in hospital tips, how do you isolate them? I know you mentioned before, you know, 10% bleach. If you can walk us through more of the in hospital, you have something you're like, oh, this could be lepto. How do you deal with that at your hospital? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, especially because a lot of times I think this is where there's uh, unfortunately unexpected and unwanted exposures. So if I have a patient that's coming in right now and um, let's say just had one that I feature all the time is Sparky. So a older dachshund that's yellow and febrile and has no vaccine history and really kind of, you know, dehydrated and really needs to be in hospital. The first thing I do immediately is, is deem them a lepto suspect. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell everybody who's working in that hospital, for my immediate team is working with the patient, and then we're going to document this is a lepto suspect. Just make some laminated cars in bright yellow and put it all over that patient, right? All over the cage, all over the notes, all over the, your whiteboard, whatever you're using. So people immediately know that equals PPE. We immediately get in PPE once we have any inkling of that. Um, and then the next thing is, is that I'm going to, if possible, get that patient hospitalized with a catheter, both IV, and also again, ideally a, a close urinary catheter collection system. We wanna make sure we're keeping that patient monitored appropriately, but that we're keeping us safe. So if that's not possible in your hospital, then to me, the next best would be to put them into an isolation ward so that there's very few people going in and out. We use accelerated hydrogen peroxide all the time. So we use the rescue, the Virox product, um, I listed up there, you know, almost every one of our in-hospital disinfectants, even the older ones are great. But remember, bleach causes nose blindness in our patients. So if that's all you have access to, you really want to limit their exposure immediately after that. Don't clean a cage with, with diluted bleach and then put a dog right in there. Um, the accelerated hydroperoxide are a great option. If I'm really worried about that patient clinically, then I draw all of my samples right away and I start treatment. I don't wait for... I don't wait for the results. I mean, ampicillin is not going to do harm and knock on one in most patients. And I'd rather get started and try to terminate that bacteremia as soon as possible and shift gears if my tests are negative. If I have a well patient though, let's say an older pug that comes in and the dad's just saying, yeah, by the way, he's peeing in the house and drinking a little bit more, but acting totally normal. 
Those are patients where I do the same. It's still a lepto suspect to me. Any PUPD patient coming into my hospital to me is a possible lepto. So we're getting in PPE for our sample collection. And then I'm also sending home prophylactically doxycycline in that patient. Now, granted, I'm in Chicago. We are a hot spot of lepto right now. I do have it on my radar because I see it a lot more. But I would really argue that many of you probably have lepto in your area and are just maybe either not looking for it, not testing for it, or both. So we, we know that the prevalence studies are really showing that this is a re-emerging disease. Excellent. And we're going to, I'll take your two case examples right now because it'll lead into my next question. So you have the patient that is sick, is febrile, is ictoric, and is going to be hospitalized. And you have that, I think you said pug that you know, is just peeing in the house. So mm -hmm. What drugs, and I know you mentioned ampicillin, doxycycline, we can bring in amoxicillin as the oral form of ampicillin. So let's take sick patient one that uh, I think is the, the febrile ictoric doxin. What drug are you going to start on that dog, oral versus intravenous, and what would be your dose? And let's take the pug who was just, you know, peeing in the house. Um, what drug are you going to send that pug home on pending stuff after you collect your tests? I know you talked about the importance of getting your samples before we start treatment. So in both yep. of those cases, if you can give me the sick dog drug and drug dose, and then the uh, healthier dog, so to speak, drug and drug dose you would use following sample collection. Absolutely. So my sick dog drug of choice would be ampicillin, 20 to 30 mg per kg IV every six to eight hours. Okay. And, and again, I would say if you have a very critically ill patient, these are not the ones to keep in your hospital if you are not a 24 hour facility because the fluid therapy that you are running on these dogs overnight needs to be a 24 hour monitor because it's incredibly high. We need to be watching ins and outs. Many of these dogs actually become oliguric or aneuric when they have severe advanced kidney disease. So this is something that if it's that critical, please either refer or have that patient in a critical facility. Um, but ampicillin, again, if the dog is in hospital and starting to improve and can take things by mouth, then I, you can go to amoxicillin. If I have the well pug who's just hanging out on dad's lap, but PUPD, it's doxycycline. And we want to do 10 mgs per kg once a day for 14 days. Excellent. Uh, question came up. And I'm going to bring up a slide. Somebody asked to please repeat our lepto acronym. Oh. So oh, wait. My nerdy, my nerdy mnemonic. <laughs> there it is. Our lepto yeah. acronym. So we'll get yeah. that up there. So I, I put this up here too, because so many of us, you know, we, we have blinders, right? We've been practicing for a while. You, you kind of be like, yeah, it's kennel cough. I don't need to test. Or yeah, it's this. I don't need to test. But lepto can look like anything. You saw those atypical clinical signs like uveitis and PUPD. It's not the yellow hunting dog. So if you have liver or kidney elevated enzymes, that could be your pre-surge um, blood work on a six-month-old puppy that's there for a spay, right? Don't ignore those. PUPD, thrombocytopenia, up to 58% of our cases, that could be an early clue for you. And then oliguria. Now, you don't see that as common, but I, it's just a focus, again, on these urination changes, whether it's too much or too little. Excellent. And there was a question, I think it was from Helen, but I don't want to misspeak, uh, who asked about the starting time for the lepto vaccine. Um, and I, I apologize if it wasn't Helen, and I'm trying to find it quickly again. No, maybe it was Molly. Um, should any lepto vaccine from any manufacturer be started at eight weeks of age? I put up um, our vaccine from Novavax here, which we're talking about today and, and discussing. Molly, I would definitely recommend, you know, it's not a blanket statement for every single uh, vaccine manufacturer. Check with that manufacturer specifically um, because there are some variations between them, not only to be very clear in the starting time, but the benefits of those vaccines. The Novavax vaccine, as Dr. Marks was talking about, does things which some others do not. Uh, prevents leptospiremia, thrombocytopenia, urine shedding, and mortality in studies. Not every vaccine um, has the same efficacy, has the same starting time, has the same safety data. So, and this, to be very clear, is not a Novavax lepto vaccine discussion. This is for all vaccines, that there are certainly variabilities between them. So it's not a, a cookie cutter blanket statement. You start at eight weeks versus 10 or 12 or whatever that may be. And I'm not trying to be anything, I'm not trying to be vague, just trying to be very straightforward. There are differences between them and don't take you know, one discussion as, as carte blanche for all of the, all of the options out there. 
Absolutely. If you have any other questions, we'll try to get to one or two more. I know everyone, I'm sure, has a, a busy day today in clinics and such. We want to respect your time, but also want to make sure we get to questions. And we got to really most of them. Um, and again, I want to remind everyone to please make sure that, and I'll throw up that slide one more time just so everyone gets it. You please fill out our registration form so you can get, there it is, your QR code or registration form. And I will highlight that, uh, solo that again so you can see it big and bright, hopefully, uh, if it'll work. Um, otherwise, please make sure you um, use your smartphone or use your, there we go, or use your, uh, type in that URL so we can please make sure you get your CE credit. We're gonna leave that on for approximately another, another 20 minutes. So it looks like we got to most of our questions. So I wanted to, yeah, we're reaching our 140 Eastern time and uh, want to be respectful of everyone. Um, but I wanted to thank, first of all, again, thank Dr. Marks. Awesome, awesome presentation. Great cliff notes. It really, really was a great cliff notes on uh, exactly what we need to do, what we need to think about with Lyme. You know, the take home points that I took from with, this. With lepto, with lepto. Sorry, <laughs> lepto. I was looking at something else. Of lepto, right? We're talking about brilliant of lepto. Like, wait, no, 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 I, wait, I lectured on the wrong topic. <laughs> lepto, the things that I took home from this, uh, and, and uh, I always try to take a couple of take home points that are really clinical. I think the important things for me, and Dr. Marks, you can throw out some of yours as well, or you can agree, um, to make sure that we get our samples for lepto to test prior to starting, especially PCR, because um, even one or two doses of an antibiotic can totally dismantle your PCR results. So yep. get those samples early. We all know how it is, right? We'd send out a CBC chem, there is a T-MIC, and then we go, oh, I didn't get liquid gold, as Dr. Marty <laughs> said. Why didn't we get the urine before we started fluids or, or therapy? So make sure you get your samples. If they are a suspect, get your samples. Worst case scenario, you chuck them later, right? But you have them if you need. So get your samples. I love the fact what Dr. Mark's a common question that I always get when I talk about lepto is what would I do if it's a multi pet household, multi dog household? Well, I do things. What would I do in my life? I'm going to ask you to do the same. That's my recommendation. I treat your pet like mine. If I have three dogs and one is a lepto suspect or lepto positive, they all get treated. I love that you said that. That was a big take home for me as well. And I love the ampicillin doxycycline discussion of sick versus healthy and the dose ranges. So those to me were my take homes. Well, Dr. Marks, before we, we, we say goodbye to everyone, is there anything else that you would love to say? You know, this is, if you remember nothing else, this is what yeah. I want you to know. Okay, so three quick pearls. The first is the Yorkie right? Just because they supposedly live in somebody's arm on their shoulder and never touch the ground, that's not true, right? How many times have we heard, I don't need heartworm prevention, my dog just goes outside to potty and back in, right? They are exposed. So I want people to kind of take that stereotypical large breed hunting dog in the woods. This is happening all over the country, every type of environment. So that's number one. The second is the atypical clinical signs. Look at the eyeballs. I think so many of us in practice just kind of go, oh, looks okay. Look at the eyeballs because uveitis is one key factor that could lead you to tick or lepto disease and we could get an early diagnosis and really make a difference. And the third is to remember we are public health officers. We are treating the pet and the family, right? We're protecting them. So when I talk about PUPD, it's not just that senior patient. It's those puppies that refuse to house train. I've had several dogs come in where they just keep peeing in the house, peeing in the house, and guess what? They've picked up lepto from the koi pond in their backyard. So keep in mind, it's it's we have to ask those history questions and we're taking care of the family, especially now with the pandemic, right? It's we we are the experts in zoonotic disease and we should shine. Awesome. Well, oh, awesome information. I wanted to thank you all for being here with us today. Again, please make sure to fill out that attendance and registration form. Dr. Marks, thank you again for being an awesome Beck Girl speaker. Thank you to Merck Animal Health. And we certainly hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Uh, stay safe. Keep washing your hands, wear masks where appropriate, and we'll see everyone online in our next Vecral event. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.